He calls his sheep by name. Chapter 10 Let me set this before you as plainly as I can. If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good, a sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he gets them all out, he leads them and they follow because they are familiar with his voice. They won't follow a stranger's voice, but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. Jesus told this simple story, but they had no idea what he was talking about. So he tried again. I'll be explicit then. I am the gate for the sheep. All those others are up to no good. Sheep stealers, every one of them. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for, will freely go in and out and find pasture. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd puts the sheep before himself, sacrifices himself if necessary. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf come and runs for it, leaving the sheep to be ravaged and scattered by the wolf. He's only in it for the money. The sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and my own sheep know me. In the same way, the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I put the sheep before myself, sacrificing myself if necessary. You need to know that I have other sheep in addition to those in this pen. I need to gather and bring them, too. They'll also recognize my voice. Then it will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I freely lay down my life. And so I am free to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own free will. I have the right to lay it down. I also have the right to take it up again. I received this authority personally from my father. This kind of talk caused another split in the Jewish ranks. A lot of them were saying, he's crazy, a maniac, out of his head completely. Why bother listening to him? But others weren't so sure. These aren't the words of a crazy man. Can a maniac open blind eyes? They were celebrating Hanukkah just then in Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was strolling in the temple across Solomon's porch. The Jews, circling him, said, How long are you going to keep us guessing? If you're the Messiah, tell us straight out. Jesus answered, I told you, but you don't believe. Everything I've done has been authorized by my Father, actions that speak louder than words. You don't believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them real and eternal life. They are protected from the destroyer for good. No one can steal them from out of my hand. The father who put them under my care is so much greater than the destroyer and thief. No one could ever get them away from him. I and the father are one heart and mind. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to throw at him. Jesus said, I have made a present to you from the Father of a great many good actions. For which of these acts do you stone me? The Jews said, We're not stoning you for anything good you did, but for what you said, this blasphemy of calling yourself God. Jesus said, I'm only quoting your inspired scriptures, where God said, I tell you, you are gods. If God called your ancestors gods, and scripture doesn't lie, why do you yell, blasphemer, blasphemer, at the unique one the Father consecrated and sent into the world just because I said, I am the Son of God? If I don't do the things my Father does, well and good, don't believe me. But if I am doing them, put aside for a moment what you hear me say about myself and just take the evidence of the actions that are right before your eyes. Then, perhaps things will come together for you and you'll see that not only are we doing the same thing, we are the same, Father and Son. He is in me. I am in Him. They tried yet again to arrest Him, but He slipped through their fingers. He went back across the Jordan to the place where John first baptized and stayed there. A lot of people followed Him over. They were saying, John did no miracles, but everything He said about this man has come true. Many believed in Him then and there. The Death of Lazarus Chapter 11 A man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. 
When Jesus got the message, he said, This sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's Son. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, but oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed on where he was for two more days. After the two days, he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. They said, Rabbi, you can't do that. The Jews are out to kill you. You're going back? Jesus replied, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daylight doesn't stumble because there's plenty of light from the sun. Walking at night, he might very well stumble because he can't see where he's going. He said these things and then announced, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up. The disciples said, Master, if he's gone to sleep, he'll get a good rest and wake up feeling fine. Jesus was talking about death, while his disciples thought he was talking about taking a nap. Then Jesus became explicit. Lazarus died, and I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. You are about to be given new grounds for believing. Now, let's go to him. That's when Thomas, the one called the twin, said to his companions, Come along, well, we might as well die with him. When Jesus finally got there, he found Lazarus already four days dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, only a couple of miles away, and many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother. Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. Jesus said, Your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know that it will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. You don't have to wait for the end. I am, right now, resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? Yes, Master. All along I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. After saying this, she went to her sister Mary and whispered in her ear, The teacher is here and is asking for you. The moment she heard that, she jumped up and ran out to him. Jesus had not yet entered the town, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run off, they followed her, thinking she was on her way to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was waiting and fell at his feet, saying, Master, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews with her sobbing, a deep anger welled up within him. He said, Where did you put him? Master, come and see, they said. Now Jesus wept. The Jews said, Look how deeply he loved him. Others among them said, Well, if he loved him so much, why didn't he do something to keep him from dying? After all, he opened the eyes of a blind man. Then Jesus, the anger again welling up within him, arrived at the tomb. It was a simple cave in the hillside with a slab of stone laid against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. The sister of the dead man, Martha, said, Master, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus looked her in the eye. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then to the others, Go ahead, take away the stone. They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and prayed, Father, I'm grateful that you have listened to me. I know you always do listen. But on account of this crowd standing here, I've spoken so that they might believe that you sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out! And he came out, a cadaver, wrapped from head to toe and with a kerchief over his face. Jesus told them, Unwrap him and let him loose. The man who creates God's signs. That was a turnaround for many of the Jews who were with Mary. They saw what Jesus did and believed in him. But some went back to the Pharisees and told on Jesus. The high priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Jewish ruling body. What do we do now, they asked. This man keeps on doing things, creating God signs. If we let him go on, pretty soon everyone will be believing in him, and the Romans will come and remove what little power and privilege we still have. Then one of them, it was Caiaphas, the designated chief priest that year, spoke up. Don't you know anything? Can't you see that it's to our advantage that one man dies for the people, rather than the whole nation be destroyed? He didn't say this of his own accord, 
but as chief priest that year, he unwittingly prophesied that Jesus was about to die sacrificially for the nation. And not only for the nation, but so that all God's exile-scattered children might be gathered together into one people. From that day on, they plotted to kill him. So Jesus no longer went out in public among the Jews. He withdrew into the country bordering the desert to a town called Ephraim and secluded himself there with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was coming up. Crowds of people were making their way from the country up to Jerusalem to get themselves ready for the feast. They were curious about Jesus. There was a lot of talk of him among those standing around in the temple. What do you think? Do you think he'll show up at the feast or not? Meanwhile, the high priests and Pharisees gave out the word that anyone getting wind of him should inform them. They were all set to arrest him. Anointing His Feet Chapter 12 Six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus, so recently raised from the dead, was living. Lazarus and his sisters invited Jesus to dinner at their home. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those sitting at the table with them. Mary came in with a jar of very expensive aromatic oils, anointed and massaged Jesus' feet, and then wiped them with her hair. The fragrance of the oils filled the house. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, even then getting ready to betray him, said, Why wasn't this oil sold and the money given to the poor? It would have easily brought three hundred silver pieces. He said this not because he cared two cents about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of their common funds, but also embezzled them. Jesus said, Let her alone. She's anticipating and honoring the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you. You don't always have me. Word got out among the Jews that he was back in town. The people came to take a look, not only at Jesus, but also at Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. So the high priests plotted to kill Lazarus, because so many of the Jews were going over and believing in Jesus on account of him. See how your king comes. The next day, the huge crowd that arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jerusalem. They broke off palm branches and went out to meet him, and they cheered, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in God's name! Yes, the King of Israel! Jesus got a young donkey and rode it, just as the scripture has it. No fear, daughter Zion. See how your king comes, riding a donkey's colt. The disciples didn't notice the fulfillment of many scriptures at the time, but after Jesus was glorified, they remembered that what was written about him matched what was done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, was there giving eyewitness accounts. It was because they had spread the word of this latest God sign that the crowd swelled to a welcoming parade. The Pharisees took one look and threw up their hands. It's out of control. The world's in a stampede after him. A grain of wheat must die. There were some Greeks in town who had come up to worship at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. Jesus answered, Time's up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you'll be where I am, ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Right now, I'm storm-tossed. And what am I going to say? Father, get me out of this? No, this is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Father, put your glory on display. A voice came out of the sky. I have glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. The listening crowd said, Thunder! Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus said, The voice didn't come for me, but for you. At this moment, the world is in crisis. Now Satan, the ruler of this world, will be thrown out, and I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. Voices from the crowd answered, 
Oh, we heard from God's law that the Messiah lasts forever. How can it be necessary, as you put it, that the Son of Man be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said, For a brief time still, the light is among you. Walk by the light you have so darkness doesn't destroy you. If you walk in darkness, you don't know where you're going. As you have the light, believe in the light. Then the light will be within you and shining through your lives. You'll be children of light. Their eyes are blinded. Jesus said all this and then went into hiding. All these God signs he had given them and they still didn't get it, still wouldn't trust him. This proved that the prophet Isaiah was right. God, who believed what we preached? Who recognized God's arm, outstretched and ready to act? First they wouldn't believe, then they couldn't. Again, just as Isaiah said, their eyes are blinded, their hearts are hardened, so that they wouldn't see with their eyes and perceive with their hearts, and turn to me, God, so I could heal them. Isaiah said these things after he got a glimpse of God's cascading brightness that would pour through the Messiah. On the other hand, a considerable number from the ranks of the leaders did believe, but because of the Pharisees, they didn't come out in the open with it. They were afraid of getting kicked out of the meeting place. When push came to shove, they cared more for human approval than for God's glory. Jesus summed it all up when he cried out, Whoever believes in me, believes not just in me, but in the one who sent me. Whoever looks at me is looking, in fact, at the one who sent me. I am light that has come into the world so that all who believe in me won't have to stay any longer in the dark. If anyone hears what I am saying and doesn't take it seriously, I don't reject him. I didn't come to reject the world. I came to save the world. But you need to know that whoever puts me off, refusing to take in what I'm saying, is willfully choosing rejection. The word, the word made flesh that I have spoken and that I am, that word and no other is the last word. I'm not making any of this up on my own. The Father who sent me gave me orders, told me what to say and how to say it. And I know exactly what his command produces. Real and eternal life. That's all I have to say. What the Father told me, I tell you. Washing his disciples' feet. Chapter 13. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave this world, to go to the Father. Having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. It was supper time. The devil by now had Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot, firmly in his grip, all set for the betrayal. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. When he got to Simon Peter, Peter said, Master, you wash my feet? Jesus answered, You don't understand now what I'm doing, but it will be clear enough to you later. Peter persisted, You're not going to wash my feet, ever. Jesus said, If I don't wash you, you can't be part of what I'm doing. Master, said Peter, not only my feet then, wash my hands, wash my head. Jesus said, If you've had a bath in the morning, you only need your feet washed now and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you understand, is holiness, not hygiene. So now you're clean, but not every one of you. He knew who was betraying him. That's why he said, not every one of you. After he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe, put it back on, and went back to his place at the table. Then he said, Do you understand what I've done to you? You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A servant is not ranked above his master. An employee doesn't give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. The one who ate bread at my table. I'm not including all of you in this. I know precisely whom I've selected, so as not to interfere with the fulfillment of this scripture. The one who ate bread at my table turned on his heel against me. 
I'm telling you all of this ahead of time so that when it happens, you will believe that I am who I say I am. Make sure you get this right. Receiving someone I send is the same as receiving me, just as receiving me is the same as receiving the one who sent me. After he said these things, Jesus became visibly upset, and then he told them why. One of you is going to betray me. The disciples looked around at one another, wondering who on earth he was talking about. One of the disciples, the one Jesus loved dearly, was reclining against him, his head on his shoulder. Peter motioned to him to ask who Jesus might be talking about. So, being the closest, he said, Master, who? Jesus said, The one to whom I give this crust of bread after I've dipped it. Then, he dipped the crust and gave it to Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot. As soon as the bread was in his hand, Satan entered him. What you must do, said Jesus, do, do it, and get it over with. No one around the supper table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that since Judas was their treasurer, Jesus was telling him to buy what they needed for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Judas, with the piece of bread, left. It was night. A new command. When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is seen for who he is, and God seen for who he is in him. The moment God is seen in him, God's glory will be on display. In glorifying him, he himself is glorified. Glory all around. Children, I'm with you for only a short time longer. You are going to look high and low for me. But just as I told the Jews, I'm telling you, where I go, you are not able to come. Let me give you a new command. Love one another. In the same way I loved you, you love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples, when they see the love you have for each other. Simon Peter asked, Master, just where are you going? Jesus answered, You can't now follow me where I'm going. You will follow later. Master, said Peter, why can't I follow now? I'll lay down my life for you. Really? You'll lay down your life for me? The truth is that before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times.